welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and I'm today here with my uh, kind of mentor, Joel Gensberg from Regenesis. I've been learning with him the last few with you the last few months about regenerative development. And we thought it would be great to share with the audience a bit of what is regenerative development and how that could help us be in a more healthy and regenerative place of uh, being meeting conflicts in our lives and in the world around us. Joel, you've been, I mean, you have an amazing life journey. I'm going to just give a bit, some, some little snippets of it to people. So you have 25, more than 25 years experience as an applied naturalist to land and community development projects throughout the States. And later on, you've been working on, on many in different continents, Africa, South America. You, also, you worked with a variety of Native American tribes and communities. I think for a certain time, you even lived in one. And you've, you've worked a long time with permaculture, uh, then you end up kind of understanding that permaculture work needed to integrate the human aspects into it and, uh, and, and then start that led you to create the regenesis uh, with, with some other colleagues. And yeah, you've, you've also, you also do, you also do tracking, which is a very interesting, uh, uh, activity of looking at the, the, the traces of, of the movement of animals through the land. So really welcome. Thank I'm you. so it's happy to have you. you here. Thank you. So perhaps we can start just invite you to tell us a bit of your journey. What led you to, to on this to, to meet, to think, to start to work on uh, regenerative development? What happened to you? <laughs> what happened to me? <laughs> um, well, when I was a little kid, I lived in the city in Philadelphia, and it was in the '60s, and everything was very rectilinear. Everything was man-made, seemed man-made, even the parks and the the trees and the rivers. And when I was about seven, eight years old, we moved out to the country, what was the edge of the suburbs, then where my mother had grown up, and was surrounded by fields and forests and farms and um, spent my life in this little patch of forest that was behind our house and um, was blessed to have many hours to simply wander and look and explore and, and play and see what I could find. And that led me to wonder about all the people that had lived there before us and how they had lived in a way that had um, develop these landscapes that we had just little remnants of. And so I studied as much as I could of the native peoples, of what they did and how they lived. And so then years later, when I was in college, I was working construction because that's what my dad did. So my dad was a, a builder. And so I grew up in that world and we were finishing a house here in Santa Fe, New Mexico that I was helping to build while I was in college. And a landscaper showed up and started to repair all the damage we had wrought. And I decided I'd much prefer to do that. And at the time, many of my, much of my college years, I spent living in a teepee in the hills. And that was one of the ways I dealt with being inside the classroom for so much of my time and reading books. And so I got a job with Plants of the Southwest and began to learn about native plants and then I heard about this idea of permaculture and I began to grow gardens and learn about how could we, um, instead of human beings being separate from nature, imposing their will on nature, how could they um, propose? How could we um, observe what was going on around us and make little changes that could provide us with all the things that we need, food, fiber, shelter, and all the rest and um, worked pretty successfully educating, um, designing, learning um, around permaculture for a number of years. But 
myself and colleague Ben Haggard, who I heard of permaculture from first, and Tim Murphy, um, all three of us were dissatisfied with the effects of what we were doing permaculturally, that um, people second-guessed our designs, they were not fully implemented, or they had a very short lifespan. And so we met um, Bob and Pamela Mang, who were working on living systems thinking, um, working with people, working with people's thinking, doing organizational development work. And we realized that that was what we needed to learn, and they realized that they needed to learn what we knew about looking at the landscape. And so um, I was quite happy being the guy that walked around outside and tried to explain to people what the earth was saying or what the earth wanted to sing in that place or tracking the landscape history pre-human and post-human. And um, I found that what I really needed to do was begin to um, work on my own thinking and work with people because that's really um, the acupuncture point that makes the difference. It's not, it's not that we don't understand ecosystems well enough. It's that we don't understand humans well enough to live in the ways that we need to, to regenerate the living systems of the planet. So um, that's how I came to Regenesis. And that's why we've been doing these educational programs and to try to engage more people in this way of thinking, this way of working, this perspective. And um, it's always been an integration for me of these kind of three ways of looking at patterns. And one of those you mentioned is the permaculture, which is really um, about looking at the patterns of nature and seeing how we would do that least change for the greatest effect that would turn the problem into the solution. And that's a matter of tracking patterns to find that, that integration, much like a martial art. And the tracking work, um, you can track anything and everything is a track, right? This cup is a track of industrial processes and cultural processes, our names are tracks of social cultural processes and so everything and I was we thinking see is, about that, like even, even our faces somehow are tracks, right? Are tracks of our life movement. Everything we see is a track, right? And yeah. it's, can we look behind those tracks to see the patterns of movement of processes of the living world, right? Life is a process. And we mostly see the physical world and are entirely or relatively ignorant of that invisible world of process of life that's behind. And that all ties into this regenerative development work, which is really about how do we see those underlying patterns and how do we shift those patterns, including our patterns of, of thought and vision. Um, it's interesting to me um, that this is all about conflict right? because there's... Um, there's this wonderful quote from a pre-Socratic philosopher, Heraclitus, who says, they don't see how pulling apart is pulling together, as in the backbent tension of the bow and the lyre. And like probably everybody else, I don't like conflict. I try to avoid conflict and try to make people feel better and all the rest, but um, if the fibers of my shirt, the warp and the woof of this fabric or any fabric, stop pushing on one another, stop trying to go their own way and create tension, it will fall apart. And the same thing is true in an ecosystem. If the lion lies down with the lamb, the sheep will overgraze the landscape and will have flood and famine and drought, right? Um, and I think that that is one of the key things we miss about the living world is that we're so used to this idea of hierarchy, right? We see the lion as being this raiding warlord king that's oppressing us serfs and servants. And of course we're praying for them to be nice, right? But the lion loves the lamb 
lion, the wolf doesn't hate the deer. The wolf loves the deer, right? And it, if the wolf stops playing its role in the ecosystem, the fabric of that ecosystem falls apart. Just like if the grass would stop playing its role or the trout would stop playing its role. And that doesn't mean we'd be a jerk to be a jerk, but we create tension to create tension. But that is the true meaning of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, is that all of these perspectives are essential for us to understand the whole. And that so much of our problems come from judging. Oh, the problem is the industrialists. Oh, the problem is mining. Oh, the problem is industrial agriculture. The problem is capitalism. Oh, the pro instead of, no, what are the values of all of those things so that we can weave them into this basket of the socio-ecological whole? It's interesting you're saying what, what you're saying because I mean, somewhere along the line of, of human development in the planet, some, some new patterns emerged kind of moving us away from that balance that you talk about the lion because you were once like the lion, right? We were once mm. on the top of the food chain, but we had other predators with whom we had to share the space. But somehow on the way, because of our capacity to create um, instruments and and we kind of gained a, a huge uh, exponential increase in capacity of of this domination and you know exploitation of the of the ecosystem around us and and so we shifted that that those the, the ways of of being in deeply uh, in, in balance with the ecosystem around and I wonder, like, if, if you look at these days, because that's a long journey, because this is happening already for, <laughs> for a few millennia, at, at least some people say since the time of, uh, of, of agriculture, of uh, starting se se sedentarization, people get fixed in, in settle settlements. Some people say it even started before with the uh, emergence of language. But I'm, I'm curious more to look at nowadays that, we are getting to the limits of this way of, of that this society, this way of living that we build. Like we are in a particular moment, there's COVID, there's all these things. So we are being invited to something. And our intention with the summit was really looking at what ways, what are the patterns that we are uh, stacking that a lot get us in, in a way reproducing solutions or reproducing outcomes nobody wants when it comes to meeting inner conflicts in us or in between people or in the larger structures of society. And I'm curious to see like how you see that as someone that is looking at tracks and looking at patterns and is working with uh, regenerative development, how you look at what are the patterns that we are somehow stuck and what other ways you've been seeing because you've been working with different communities. So maybe you've been also observing other patterns, either in traditional communities or in intentional communities that are emerging that could give hints on other ways of being with conflict that could, could help us, you know, get, get a more, be in a more healthy, regenerative place, let's say. It's a great question. So, um, right, so much of everything is our perspective. It's one of the first things of tracking, right, is you put the track between the source of light and your eye, right, and you put your head down or you put your head at the level of the animal so you can see what they see. So the run that was invisible when you're standing upright appears when you put your head down where the animal's eyes are. And so much of conflict is not being able to see the other point of view or the value of the other point of view. And it's one of the things I love about this old permaculture principle of the problem is the solution. It's not that you're trying to solve that and get rid of it. And at Regenesis, we talk about it as, um, you know, the problem is where the potential lies, right? How do we turn problems into potential? And um, there's this framework we use a lot, which is called the law of three. It comes from the Sufis by way of Gurdjieff. 
And it really is, Gurdjieff used to say that we are trapped because we are third force blind. We live in this world of two forces, my way or your way, and we end up fighting over things instead of seeing that there might be something that is superordinate, something that we both care about. That, you know, I may believe in gun rights and you may believe in gun control, but we're both about safety. And we are disagreeing about the instrument. We're disagreeing about the way of getting there. Um, because we're clinging on to our ideas instead of going back to what we really want and truly being creative. So one of my favorite examples of this, where we're actually valuing the restraints, valuing the problem, is like the igloo. Right? I want to live here. I want to survive. And it's too darn cold here. It's so frigid cold that I'm going to die. And now what do we do? We fly in these prefab buildings and barrels and barrels of oil and we heat it up and we cause all these additional problems because we see the cold as the problem we need to overcome. Mm. And the Inuit, they were intelligent and they created the igloo. Oh, I'll make a structure that is created by the cold, right? Or even bread is a prime example. Yeah, I have all this, I have this grain I want to feed my family with, but it's going to spoil. I'll spoil it into bread. Or I have all this milk, I'll spoil it into camembert or into yogurt or, right? And we don't realize that so many of our truly creative things that we do as humans are because of those restraints. And there's this beautiful book called The Power of Limits. And it's all about patterns. It's all about the logarithmic spiral, the branching patterns, the, um, the golden mean. And one of the things he points out is that every pattern is a matter of a limit. And that one of the things you're really pointing at is as humans, we've tended to push against limits. And you see this with children, right? My three-year-old, he wants to stay up late or he wants to eat this or he doesn't want to sit down now, right? We're always, always pushing, stretching, always right? stretching. <laughs> but those limits are actually what force us to be creative. That that is where human creativity and any kind of creativity comes in is because of those limits. And that it's as true for the Inuit not trying to overcome the cold, but use the cold as it is for us with capitalism and industrialism and pollution and all of those things. How do we actually see the value in them? How do we use them to um, reconcile that conflict? How do we use that conflict to force us to be creative? Hmm. That's very interesting. And it, it, it um, to me, it relates a lot with one, one of the things I learned in permaculture that you, 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 you know for sure, but it, it, it relates a lot to this idea of limits is that it's the edges is the, the, the edges are the, the, the most rich spaces because it's where things kind of meet each other. Mm -hmm. So for me also, in a way, what I'm hearing you saying, or let's say if we think about conflict is, is like, it's the place where we meet each other. Because mm -hmm. I, I used to say, like, for instance, working with people, if you haven't come to a conflict and, and overcome it, you are not a team. You are, you are barely touching the surface of who you are together, you know. So it's mm -hmm. really this, there's this sense of, of really meeting each other. And, and you mentioned that we, we need to be in a place of openness towards um, what is the perspective of the other. But I think one thing I've noticed, and I know I don't know if it rings up something for you, but is that most of the places, the spaces today, all of us, and then all the, the the common spaces we inhabit, have we come with with the baggage, yeah, with the luggage on our back, and part of that luggage that has been passed through generations is deep traumas seated in our cultures, and then some of them then reproduced in our families, and I wonder, in your work with nature and, and human nature, what kind of insights have you been gaining of, of, about how to go about this? Because obviously, I mean, if, if the many discussions taking place in conflicts within, between people 
if we go deeper, there are some of these traumas are the triggers. So there's something there that often is not touched upon and they just remain on the conflict of winning or losing on this kind of surface level. Right. That's a great question, Nuno. Um, so one of the things you remind me of is Paulo Freire mm -hmm. talking about the colonized mind, and this whole idea of the colonized mind, where um, both the oppressed and the oppressor begin to have this two-force worldview where it's about winning or losing. And it's why we end up so... I, I got to go to Zimbabwe and teach a few years ago, and we went by Mugabe's palace, which is these, you know, three, four meter high walls with barbed wire on the front and armed guards. And all my friends from Zimbabwe said, do not look, don't look. They're filming us. Don't, don't make eye contact. And when I was in college, Zimbabwe, right, there's even a Bob Marley song about it. It was so help, hopeful, right? And it's that um, once our minds become colonized, even when we win liberation, we become the oppressors, right? And this has been the case, as you said, for millennia, right? Slaves and servants and serfs and peones and whatever word you want to call it, that we all grow from that trauma. And that trauma, then usually what we do as human beings is we traumatize other people or we traumatize the land. And that is the story that we're playing out unconsciously. And um, there are remarkable stories. There's one story that is fantastic to me. That's an incredible insight that's at least a thousand years old comes to us from the Haudenosaunee, the people at the Longhouse, the Iroquois. And they tell a story that they were once five warring tribes where it was horrible, where women were drowning their babies because they didn't want them to suffer being a, an oppressor or being oppressed or what both sides. Right. And, um, it's a long story, it takes nine days to tell, but um, this person came, the peacemaker, who began to help them, and he had a message of the good mind, which I see as the, the human mind, not the colonized mind, right? And he says, if you have a good mind that's free from trauma and pain, you will see the value of peace, right? And then you will realize that peace is true power. And he gets people to stop fighting, but he notices their minds, their hearts are still on the ground. They're still traumatized by what they did or what was done to them, even if they're not fighting. And he realized that the secession of violence is not peace. The secession of violence is not peace. And there's a, meanwhile, this man um, we call Hiawatha, his name was Ayanwata, and he was a good man. He had these seven beautiful daughters and this horrible... Um, kind of shaman warlord wanted to marry his daughters and ended up killing them all and his wife and he's traumatized wandering around in the forest torn up he doesn't care what happens to him and when people come see him he's in so much pain they kind of walk away they can't deal with it and one day he's watching as these ducks land on this little pond and more ducks land and more ducks land and more ducks land and eventually something Thing, scares them all off and there's so many ducks that the few droplets of water on each of their backs empties the pond and this is this kind of wakes him up and he goes and he finds all these shells in the base of the pond and he makes this frame and he starts to string them up and lay them on this frame and comes up with these condolences if i were to see a man in my state I would take the softest deer skin and cleanse his eyes so he could see the beauty of the world again. I'd take the softest feather and cleanse his ears so he could hear the beauty of the cleanest water that he could take, wash that lump from his throat. On and on. And the peacemaker hears him. And even though saying it to himself has not healed him, the peacemaker sits in front of him and looks in his eyes and condoles him. And it brings him back. It brings him back to the good mind. And so they go and they condole every man, woman, and child 
And eventually the only one who's holding out is this man Tadadahu, this evil man who has killed Ayanwata's family. And finally they make him stop. And he says, what's in it for me? And they make him the fire keeper at the center of the nation. That he will make the decisions when the older brother and the younger brother, the House and the Senate, cannot decide. And he is condoled by Ayanwata, whose family he killed. And it's that this evil, evil, bad person, we can't kill him. He's a part of the community. And uh, I was, you know, that, that movie, um, Avatar? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where they destroy the beautiful tree of life and they're fight and uh, in the climactic scene where the Marine turns native is fighting his colonel. My wife, Erin, she started to cry and cry and cry. And I thought, you know, it was just upsetting to her. And I finally understood she was saying, he's killing his shadow. And it ruined the movie for me because I, you know, he's the hero. He's fighting for righteousness. The guy, just, and <laughs> it made me realize he's a marine. He's fighting a marine. If he could see a different way, what's? Why are we so sure this other man cannot see a different way? Mm-hmm. If we can get past our traumas to see something beautiful, aren't we using the colonized mind to judge these other people to say they don't understand and they cannot have a heart and they cannot see beauty and they cannot care? And I, I think we, as traumatized people, we traumatize others, even if it's just othering people in our minds. It just recalled me that there's this movie I don't remember the name of the director, but it's like actually a three, three, uh, three, a, tri- a tri- trilogy, trilogy. Yeah, trilogy. that's how you say it, trilogy. Uh, it's called Human, and it's it's like a black screen, a black background, and people just being interviewed on themes themes about life, love, uh, family, uh, and and the first interview, I think, is the first is a, is a is a guy, a young guy that is in the in the death uh, corridor. So he was he was sentenced to death because he killed a lady and and her son or her daughter. And he is telling his story about how much he got abused from his parent, his father, so much that he grew up thinking that loving someone was causing was inflicting pain on on on, on mm-hmm. the person. And so he, he's done that all his life. He ended end up killing this, this lady and the kid, went to prison, and then he starts to tell that he starts this correspondence with another lady who actually showed him, him what real love was. Mm-hmm. And he's falling apart, crying, and then he says, this lady was the mother of the, of the woman and the grandmother of the child he killed that actually made a movement towards understanding why he has done such a such a tremendous act and every time i see that i i cry because it's like can you imagine like what is i can't imagine what it's like to be in a place that to take what most probably for us is the most uh, sacred thing that is our sons and daughters and mm-hmm. have that be in that space of ex- extreme pain and, and loss and still have this kind of the human ability to have that gesture of understanding and what that opens up, because he he, he end up understanding finally what the real love, what real love could look like, you know. So that's that's amazing. It's a bit touching on a bit of the story you brought also of there's always the possibility of a shift. And what I find interesting is in our society is pretty much everything focused on the individual so it's like you have to get your own stuff together you know so it's not and what you are saying from the story is that actually this is something communal there's a communal holding of the community as a whole where there's no such thing as this is your solely your private matter and solve it yourself don't don't come to me with your with your stuff you know so I, I wonder what it's like. I mean, if you think uh, in in 
if you kind of put regenerative development lenses on 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 uh, on, on or invite people to think in that way, what do you think is the the the, the function or or uh, or what could be the function of, of conflicts? You already hinted a bit at it because you said, according to permaculture, problem problem is the solution. So there's, when you think about conflicts, like in families, in groups of people, in between people, what is it? Uh, what is it trying to invite us into or trying to tell us? What is what is the function of conflict? You may, you talked about tensions also, so right. I want to explore that a bit more. Sure. Um, well, you you use this word really briefly, um, sacred, and you know the story you told that woman, what she did was sacred, and it's almost beyond human imagining, and it it. Um, it raises the bar for all of us, hmm. right? It shows us what is the potential in the problem. And, and what she did was she took that conflict and grew from it. And she grew in a way that enabled her to help this man to grow, right? Because she was wise enough to recognize no child deserves to be treated in the way that he was treated. And he wasn't doing that because he was bad. He was doing that because his mind was colonized. His mind was, he could not see clearly because that, that pain um, distorted his vision. And so conflict always forces us to pause. It forces us to question ourselves, right? We, we can simply put our heads down and bulldoze our way through that conflict um, or run away from it. Or we could pause and say, um, what can I learn here? What can I see here that I wouldn't have seen without that conflict? We all know in our lives, right? We kind of go along, dum to dum to dum we're in this cool groove and it becomes a rut and you know, whatever, we have a car accident or we get divorced or we get fired from our job or um, that one trick we've gotten so used to just stops working. And it's really only then that we will question and we'll look again and we'll say, oh, am, am I so sure that this is true? Am I so sure that this is the right way of doing things? And um I've often said that um, one of the oddest things to me about when I was in college is that spending most of our time as like 20 something year olds and not being around children and not being around our elders much, um, we didn't have restraints. We didn't have people doing what elders should, which is to try to direct us or keep us in line. We didn't have younger children that we wanted to behave appropriately for because they were around. Um, and I think it that as you're pointing out, community and society and those conflicts, even between the old and the young or the really young, um, what they can do if we let them is get ourselves to pause. Just like whether you fast, you sit up on the hill, the, it's what the Sabbath is meant to be, right? Or any pilgrimage or anything. You're, whatever you're fasting from for whatever period of time, it makes you appreciate it. It makes you consider it. It makes you be able to think about your life. It's one of the things that someone said to me the other day about this COVID time, that we might be able to take this time to reconsider. I have, uh, have a friend from Taos Pueblo who told the story about coming back from Vietnam and simply wanting to go back to Vietnam. And um, his grandfather took him into a, a lodge 
and said, see that tree out there? You put, as you said, you put your baggage on that tree and you're going to sit here all night and you look at it all night. And when you get up in the morning and you go out, you can put it back on if you want to, but you, you get to choose now. Hmm. And so that's what um, Bill Plotkin, this psychologist from Animus Valley Institute, said is that ceremonies are meant to be this disturbance, this conflict, this this thing that gets us to pause so we can reconsider. And so um, can we see all of our problems, all of our conflicts as a sacred opportunity, like a ceremony that enables us to re-examine deeply? Right? Because all of us have a limited point of view. Yeah, I'm thinking that <clears throat> that this invitation is particularly relevant if I consider that all the spaces I, I or many of the spaces I look around and I'm engaging with in, in that are involved in some sort of activism or social change, there's there's this kind of common pattern of thinking that change will come as long as you do more. So you have to do more, you have to put more energy to, in order to transform. And I've been looking at like the last, I mean, I've been involved in these spaces since the 90s. So it's already like more than 20 years. But some people, when you talk about limits to growth and things like that, this comes from the 70s. So we, we are like 50 years of endless effort from thousands of people, you know, on and on, rentless investment of energy on producing the change and it seems like we are in a worst place today globally if we look at many of the of the uh, information this the, the, the in the signs around us and the, the, the landscape than we were by then so there's something there's something fundamentally wrong about this way of thinking about putting more energy and this pause is interesting one of the things I explored, I don't know if you agree or if it, if, if it rings something for you, or, but when I do my work with phenomenology and one of the things that we, we touch sometimes is that this thing of in ourselves, when I do my work of, of grappling with a certain problem or a certain inner conflict I'm living in or in, also in, in people, one thing I've started to notice is actually that as soon as I become aware or we become aware, if it's something together, that will naturally turn. So there's, it's not like I need to, where, where I need to put effort is in that moment of maybe pausing and going against my habits or my patterns and just pausing and paying attention or leaning into to the tracks to see what's going on. But then things shift by themselves. I don't need to make a huge effort to shift something when, when this thing happens, which is really interesting. Yeah, so um, what you're talking about, of all this effort that countless determined, well-intentioned people have put out, for conservation, for social justice, for all these different things, people dying in the labor movements and revolutions, and that we've gotten so little is precisely why the question that has driven me and why we started Regenesis and why all these stories are so important to me because they've shown me, ah, oh, it's because we're bringing the colonized mind that is focused on force, right? using leverage, using some kind of, seeing the world as a linear Newtonian thing, that you do this action and it will make this thing happen, it will make that thing happen, that that is the problem, that we're bringing the same worldview that created our problems into trying to solve them. And no amount of increased force will solve our problems. And that's the beautiful thing about that, the peacemaker's message of peace, the good mind, and true power, right? Is that the difference between power and force is force is over and power is something that we have together. And
it's something, you know, you, what you're talking about, Nuno, is this um, not pushing, right? What happens when you don't push? Um, there's a martial art, internal art called Bagua Zhang, that, um, which is uh, the, the eight hand changes. You might know the Bagua, the eight trigrams around that, you know, right? And um, the first time I practiced it with uh, our Sifu from Taiwan, we were doing this thing and we were kind of pushing on each other. And I very quickly found myself upside down with my head on his feet. And uh, he just went like that with his toes. Was like, Get up. And he put me there very gently, but he just took all of my pushing and put me, turned me over and laid me down on the ground. Right? <laughs> and um, there's this wonderful story from Aikido, from, um, I'm not remembering his, his name right now, Terry Dobson, who was the first American student of Uishiba, Sensei Uishiba. And he was, you know, 250 pounds, 23 years old, been practicing for years. And Sensei Uishiba um, kept saying, you don't fight, don't fight. And if there's tough guys on the corner, cross the street. Don't go hang out where you might get in a fight. He's going home one day on the subway and this drunk guy gets in covered with vomit and is pushing people out of the way and shoves this pregnant lady down in the seat. And Terry Dobson thinks, oh, here's my chance. He stands up and the guy sees him, yeah, comes running at him. And they hear this little voice say, hey. And they look and there's this nicely dressed elderly gentleman in his kimono. He says, hey, do you like to drink? Ah, what's it to you? Oh, well, my wife and I, we have this lovely plum tree out back and we love to sit outside and drink sake under our blooming plum tree. I thought perhaps you had a lovely wife and we like to drink with her. And starts to cry. And he says, no, my wife died. I lost my job. I'm a terrible person. And Terry Dobson watches and the guy sits down next to the elderly man and it's Terry Dobson's stop and he gets off and the elderly man is petting the man's head, talking to him soothingly. And Terry Dobson realizes that he had learned all of the forms of Aikido, the way of peace. But this man had tracked the pattern to see what was the little move that would go back to the source, the trauma, it was causing this man to act out in this self-hating and other hating way. Right? And he realized if he had beat the man up, it would have continued that degenerative trajectory, however just and right he was. And he realized that that was the martial art, was to track it to its source and make the little move that could turn it from degenerative into regenerative, where that man could see that we saw that he was an essential part of our community. And he could not simply be cut off or judged that he was needed, that we need him. And um, that, again, raises the bar. How do we see all these people and things doing horrible things? Um, how do we be human, right? Human comes from humus and humor from the earth, from the living earth, right? And, um, you know, there's this other gift to us from the Haudenosaunee of something called the Thanksgiving Address that I learned about from my tracking teacher, John Stokes, from the Tracking Project. And he helped put together a little book of it some years ago with Jake Swamp. And the first thing you give thanks for is the people. And um, it goes through the earth and the waters and, and everything. And when I first learned it, I had trouble thanking the winds because here in New Mexico, the winds can be so hot and dry. And it's hard <laughs> to give thanks for the winds. And then I got to the people and I was like, oh, I have to give thanks for that guy and that person and rapists and murderers. And then John said to me, well, the people that gave us this, they're giving thanks for us who colonized them. 
They're giving thanks for all the people who they know are rapists and murderers, right? And again, it raises the bar for what it means to be a human being. If they can give thanks for the colonizers, I certainly can work on developing myself to give thanks for everybody, right? And, and that is, again, that, that's where that peace, it's not just the secession of violence, comes from. It's where we're understanding, we're appreciating the value of one another, in human and non-human, yeah. right? We're appreciating the value of the virus and of the mosquito and of that rocky hill that's in the way. And um, my friend David Abrams says that what's beautiful about humans is we can fall in love with anything. We can fall in love with the sunset and that trout and my truck and right, we a person and we could fall in love with anything. And it, I, I have taken that and said, and also we can appreciate everything. We can take that tiny little fruit and over generations turn it into peaches or tomatoes, or we can turn spoiling milk into beautiful cheese, or we can turn, you know, we can turn conflict into beauty. And that is the most essential human trait we have is that we're able to, that's why we've been able to survive in every environment. Yeah. So how do we turn racism and hatred and colonization and environmental change and you know, climate change and a pandemic? How do we use that? How do we appreciate the force that's behind that and pause and consider for a moment and stop fighting, right? I'm going to beat up the drunk guy, right? And we've all put more and more effort into beating up the drunk guy Instead of uh, what is the force that's behind there? There's a, I'm not remembering her name right now. Um, many of you listeners will know her name. Who said, you cannot dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Hmm. Yeah, I don't remember who that was. Uh... Yeah, there's other ways, like uh, some people attribute to Einstein, but I think it was not who said you cannot uh, solve the problems with solve the, the same problems mind. With the same same mind. The same. Yeah, yes, exactly. That created the problems. And but I, I think it's it's interesting to look at it from uh, what we are saying from the perspective we are in now, because in a way, many people are thinking, and most for sure, the the decision makers, those in in places of power are thinking of this of this virus as as the enemy, as something to eliminate. It's a war. Uh, it's a war against the virus, and and I'm thinking like, well, this is kind of this is a really strange narrative because you know if you study a bit of of nature, viruses are everywhere. They are even in they are air they in the air in the ground in our bodies. And and I've the other day I've even seen a very interesting research around that maybe some of the virus that we have are actually helping our system to deal with other with diseases in a better way. Like it's probably where disease. we got half of our genome, right? Yeah. So it's like it's it's the same the same approach like we do with other stuff in us that we don't like. We just repress it, put it aside, think that is not part of us. And and one of the interesting things going back a bit in, in a circle to one, one thing we talked in the beginning is this kind of this thing you were talking about the forces that it's like the more you avoid something, the more you will attract it. So mm -hmm. we kind of the more we want to uh, put things away from our side, put the, the poverty or in this case, put this virus away, the more things will come in our way until we understand that. Mm -hmm. Right, the, the blow gets bigger and bigger. If we don't pay attention to this yeah. little thing and we don't make the change there, then we it takes a bigger thing and a bigger thing and a bigger thing. And, and part of what you're pointing out is one of our primary stories we have is this hero narrative, which is a great narrative for young boys, but it's not a great narrative for an entire culture. Right? And we keep thinking, we're going to be, I'm going to, Put in more effort, like you were saying, and I'm going to win this one. I'm going to save everybody in it. Yeah, save I'm the to, day. <laughs> I'm going to find the vaccine. I'm going to, you know, fight for truth, justice, and beauty. And and it's as you're saying, right? If I am in a room by myself, I am not forced to grow because no one is pushing on me, right? 
Um, there's this metaphor from Zen monasteries of that everyone is like a rough pebble put into this leather bag and rubbing on one another in this leather bag as the where the owner walks is what polishes us, right? And there's this, you know, that heroic mentality and that othering, creating the monster, um, is also what we do to nature, right? So what we have done to nature is what we're doing to one another, and it's it's this vicious cycle, and it's partly the need for a different story, and maybe that's a really old story, and maybe it's seeing ourselves. What is? I'm gonna tell another story. I'm sorry, Nuno. Um, yeah, so I was, I've had the opportunity and privilege to help co-teach this Native American permaculture course for a couple decades. And um, now it's entirely taught by Native people, which is fantastic. Um, that was really the aim from the beginning. Um, but early on, we were up at Picaris Pueblo, and I was supposed to teach, and this older man stood up, and I didn't know who he was, and I was a little pissed because it was my time. And there were... Native Americans and Anglos and Hispanic, there's all kinds of people there. And um, and you probably know in Native American communities, there's the rates of drug abuse and alcoholism and incarceration and early death, all those things are way higher than any other community, African American, Latino, whatever. And um, there were many Native youth there. And turns out this man, was the governor of the Pueblo. And he, people were, it's after lunch, people were talking. He said, hey, hold up your hands. Yeah, you, hold up your hand and make a fist. So everybody made a fist. He says, see how your knuckles go up and down, up and down? Just like the ridge of the mountain, just like the river. See how your fingers make a spiral? Just like a big storm, just like the water behind a rock. And then he looked at every one of us and he pointed. He said, no square people here. We all belong. And it was a fascinating thing he did because he showed us the tracks of the living world in our bodies that's as undeniable as my grandma's nose on my face, right? And that's part of the power of patterns, is that they work at every scale and every media, that the spiral in our hands is the same as the storm, right? The wave in our knuckles is the same as in the mountains. And he taught me, like we're spending this two weeks of what are the problems and how are we going to solve them and we're going to make swales to catch the water and we're going to make, you know, credit unions to deal with money and we're going right and and he said uh -uh. if you're trying to solve those problems from the outside with the judgment that humans are the problem and are bad you're going to not do it well you have to begin by shifting your perspective to say we're not bad we're here for a reason we all belong. What is our role? What is our role that we're here to play? And he would probably say, what's your original instructions? Where did the creator place us here? What are we supposed to be doing? Loving and appreciating this world and one another, right? Instead of, oh, we're going to solve that problem. And it's just like you're saying, by that little change of perspective, the problems began to solve themselves, right? And as you probably know, there's all this research that Native Americans, there's a wonderful book, um, Tending the Wild by M. Cat Anderson or Changes in the Land by William Cronin that show that Native peoples and around the world, there's a great book from Australia, Dark Emu, Native peoples provided for their food, shelter, energy, and fiber in ways that increased species diversity 
and increase the ecological health and the productivity of landscapes. And it was largely through forms of disturbance, whether that was fire or flooding or cutting or harvesting. And they were looking for what is that nodal intervention? What is that least change for the greatest effect that changes the pattern of the landscape instead of how do we harvest stuff or how do we leverage stuff? How do we force things into a place? How do we sit back and observe the patterns, track the patterns so we can see, oh, hey, you like to drink? Right? You must have a lovely wife. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's so because he, he basically said the same thing. You belong. You belong. I, re I see you. I see you. I see that you belong. And it changes the platform from which we're working. Right? And so much of our work in regenerative development in place is that people care about their place, whatever their perspective is. They just have different ways of caring for it. They have different ways of caring for their children, for their families, for whatever it is. They think that, oh, we need to do fracking so we can get money, so we can do this, right? And they're not wrong, right? It's, it's why in the natural step, there was that last one that was added, which is without economic, social equity, we cannot expect that these forests or these fisheries or anything else will persevere because people are going to destroy them if it's what they think they need to do to feed their children. And so we, what we need to look at is how we're doing things. It's the way in which we're doing things. There is, uh, I was just talking this morning about, I um, was working with one of my mentors, Carol Sanford. She was working with Seventh Generation. Um, and they had done all this work about non-polluting cleaners. And we began to have this discussion about what if we could create cleaners dishwasher soaps and hand soap and everything else, clothing soap that actually inoculated the waters with bacteria and fungi, algae, whatever that would clean them. Hmm. What if instead of being less bad, doing less damage, everything we did providing for our food and our shelter and our fiber and our energy was done in a way that inoculated these shifts in pattern that enabled systems to regenerate themselves, right? Which is what that little fire or putting yeast in the dough or any of those so human things, um, that's their pattern is how do we, or even an idea, right? We all, however much schooling we went to, we had one book or one teacher or one experience, or you told me about one job that totally shifted your worldview, right? And then we begin to codify that and we rigidify it. And it takes something else to break that open so we can pause and see what we're we missing. And oftentimes it's what people care about. It's their, their place. And that trumps everything. That, uh, that is superordinate to my little thing I care about. And I think that's the problem with global problems like global warming, they're too big to care about. I don't know everybody in the world. I don't know every place, but I know my neighbors and I know that hill and I know that river where I take my kids to swim or go fishing or, you know, that's what I can care about. That's what I can appreciate. Wow, well, sure. That was amazing. I, I was thinking like, one of the things that the story of the drunk man reminds me that I want to share with you is uh, I have a friend who works with a, a particular way of clowning that it's called relational clown. Mm. And I'm trying that he brings some, some things to the summit because they're doing wonderful work with elders in elder houses in the north of Portugal. And he was kind of telling me those stories, show me some videos. So basically what they do is they get there. And some of these people, they are just, some of them are just like waiting for death to come. You know, they, they kind of look 
trapped because of either the, the, the state they are mentally or physically or because of the place society also left them. They are just like they're absorbed in their own thoughts or things. And what they do is they go. And so one of the things they do that is kind of connected with your ideas or your tips about tracking is leaning to a place where they can have eye contact with the person. So if the person is looking to the ground, they will go to the ground. And they will stay there to engage in I. But then the, the thing I wanted to tell you most is that they actually, their way to create relationship is to emphasize or to, to make big some sort of uh, shortcoming of the person. So if the person has something that some trace in the face or is like very rigid or this, they will... They will do. They will kind of mirror that in an amplified way, and, and it creates all sorts of connections. The people open up w- with just that, and I thought oh, how interesting it is. Like, so I, I'm staying with our, from our conversation. There's many things. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. One is this idea that how we need to learn to work with ten to to work with tensions because tensions it what is what makes things move, right? So this kind of idea that. We need to, or they redirect, help. right? You have to. Talk. They hold together, and they they redirect. Yeah. Yeah, and they redirect. So we need definitely to work in our capacity to hold tensions, also in the, inside ourselves, because we wake up in the morning and maybe we have this force to go and do something, and another to say, "Ah, oh, if I sleep a bit more, that would be wonderful." And we are constantly dealing with these tensions, right? So how we can deal with those tensions of either, you know, increasing, releasing, and all these things of redirecting tensions in a way that is kind of generating new possibilities, looking at conflict as a, as a disruption, as something that is demanding our attention, our noticing, our leaning in, yeah. and... And then I think the other thing, which is a bit more magic, but it's I think it's the mystery part of this, or let's say is the work we need to do is in in our ways of shifting or of trying to contribute to shift patterns in us and in, in between in the way we relate with each other and with the world around towards more healing or regenerative relationships, there's this kind of... of a way there's some triggers like there's i'm thinking like for instance, the, the 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 thing with the drunk was in a way was the trigger because it made something completely different from what was expected so we need to use our imagination at the same time of, of we, are, we use our observation to learn to see the patterns but also to see beyond them to see other possibilities like where the potential mm-hmm. i think what that story illustrates to me is that on one side is that the master was not stuck on the pattern. He could see, he could open up to try to see what is behind this behavior, what could be, and then try to open a, a door to allow that to manifest. It, it could be wrong. I mean, it could go, he <laughs> tried, you know, he made a choice. Maybe this is it, or maybe I'm going to try <laughs> this way. So you never know what's going to be the outcome. That's a thing that is coming a bit, but we can, we, we know that if we don't try, we'll keep on failing miserably like yeah. we are doing. So. Yeah. Uh, so we are finishing. If you have some other things you'd like to add, please, uh, one, one last yeah. thing or two. And... Okay. Um, well, you, you reminded me of a couple of things. One is, you know, that conflict is asking for our attention. So one of the things I always see with my kids is when they're throwing a fit or they're throwing whatever or they're hitting me, they need my attention. And I will often either pick them up or get down at their level and look in their eyes, right? Because they're telling me, and they may not even know what they need attention for, but they need attention, yeah. And so it's a great way to think about conflict. What are we not paying attention to that we're being stopped by and we often are irritated by it. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to wash the dishes. I'm trying to make this phone call. I'm trying, you know, I know what I want to do. Why are you stopping me? Why are you telling me that I need to think again? And you're talking about holding tension. One of the most important tensions I think is holding that cognitive dissonance. 
being in that place of not knowing. So I always want to jump to the solution, right? And it's actually, as we know, with an electrical spark, right? The longer we can hold that cognitive dissonance, the greater opportunity we have of coming to a true creative breakthrough together, right? Um, instead of, oh, we're going to resolve it, we're going to figure it out this way because it's uncomfortable. Oh, I'll give in to you. Oh, yeah, you can have cookies for dinner, right? Instead of that, no, let's, let's be creative about this. And so um, that is, again, this thing of uh, my friend John Stokes, who I learned tracking from, he often says this thing of the way we kill the world is by saying, oh, that's just, that's just, just snowflake. It's just rain. It's just lightning. It's just a rainbow. It's just my kid, it's just my partner. It's just the Buddha. It's not just Jesus. It's just the, you know, it's just a miraculous miracle of sacred creation, right? And so what if we could see these problems, these tensions, these conflicts as a gift? There's When I was in Africa, they have this saying, which is uh, go toward the roar. Because when lions surround you or one, um, it's the old toothless one that roars so that you'll run away from the roar right into the arms of the sharp, clawed, powerful young ones. Right? And here where it snows, uh, our version is turn into the skid. Right? If you turn into the skid, you can pull out of it. But if you try to steer your way out of it, you're lost. Right? And so as much as we hate conflict, that's where we need to go. That's where I need to go to grow. That's where we need to grow as groups. Um, it's why things like diversity and inclusion and equity and all of those things we, right? And one of the things that we all know, if something hurts and, oh, if I put my head that it hurts, so I don't put my head that way. And I lose more and more of my range of motion. Instead of, no, that's exactly where I need to go. That's where I need to give attention. That's what I need to breathe into. That's precisely what is calling for our attention. And not to come up with simple solutions and simple answers to get past the conflict quickly. Um, to make deals or whatever it is, but to pause long enough and hold that cognitive dissonance together so that we can see a possibility none of us none of us have thought of before. That's a beautiful way to finish, Joe. Thank you so much for Thank you, this Nunez. wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.